So good morning. I'd like to invite you to kneel with me for a word of prayer. Dear loving God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together, even though it's on Zoom. We thank you for the technology, for the privilege of fellowship and of knowing about your Sabbath and being able to keep a Sabbath as a rest day. One in every seven, we thank you for this understanding that we have of this day and the privilege we have of keeping it. We thank you for the brilliant sunshine outside. We thank you for keeping us safe this week, even though the weather's been pretty treacherous. We pray that you would guide our thoughts and feelings heavenward. Please help us to put aside the cares of the week and to focus on spiritual things and on the truth for this time. Please send us your Holy Spirit now. Forgive us our sins. Give us that understanding and that wisdom that we need to be teachers at this time. Please guide and direct us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, Gabriella talked about the history of the Millerite movement and some of the politics that was going on in that time period. And she mentioned the gag rule. And this set me off on a, um, a kind of bit of discovery. So we're going to talk about the gag rule and we're going to see how it comes into our present history. And I think it's quite interesting the way this was a topic in the Millerite history. Uh, um, and how it is a topic for us today. So I want to start by talking a little bit about the history of it. She touched on it last week, but I think there's some interesting, just a bit more background on it, really, before we can bring it to the present day. So had everybody heard of the gag rule before she mentioned it last week? Some of us may not even heard of it this week. I don't know. No. No. Had anybody heard of it? Yes, Natalie had. Anybody else? No. I thought this was quite interesting. When I started looking at the history of it, it's quite interesting as well. So we know that in the Millerite history, their test or their the subject politically was slavery. And when we look at some of what was going on with slavery at that time, um, it's quite interesting. So if we just do a little bit of a timeline. So we have 1833, which is a significant date in the Millerite history. And... and it's a significant date politically. This was the year that the American Anti-Slavery Society um, was founded. So I'll just put that down, founded. So it's promoter and uh, yes, let's see. It called for the immediate abolition of slavery in the United States. The main activist arm of the abolition movement was this society. It was founded in 1833 under the leadership of William Lloyd Garrison. So we're just going to put Garrison there. I'll put William over here. So up to this point, um, People had been agitating slavery issues for quite some time, and um, even back as far as uh, the 1700s. But it was only in this history we begin to see a real um, agitation of the subject. And part of that agitation was brought about by women, which I thought was very interesting as well. So we'll go into that in a minute. But this, just to learn about Garrison, by 1840, this society numbered 2,000, with a total membership ranging from 150 to 200,000. The society's sponsored meetings, adapted resolutions, signed anti-slavery petitions to be sent to Congress, published journals and enlisted subscriptions, printed and distributed propaganda in vast quantities, and sent out agents and lecturers, 70 in 1836 alone, to carry the anti-slavery message to northern audiences. So this was in the north and it was to basically, um, I guess, alert the people to that how the slavery was in the south and to get rid of it. Participants in the societies were drawn mainly from religious circles. So this was obviously there were a lot of religious people in America at that time anyway. Um, and philanthropic backgrounds. So there were businessmen 
and they give the example of Theodore Dwight Weld was a religious man, but a businessman, Arthur and Lewis Trapan and lawyer Wendell Phillips, as well as from the free black community, with six blacks serving on the first board of managers. The society's public meetings were most effective when featuring the eloquent testimony of former black slaves like Frederick Douglass or William Wells Brown. So they did have black people involved and they did have people who used to be slaves, Frederick Douglass and William Brown, giving their testimony. And this was what moved the people. The society's anti-slavery activities frequently met with violent public opposition. And this is in the north, with mobs invading meetings, attacking speakers and burning presses. So people, this, it created quite a violent reaction. And so it was quite um, a life-threatening thing to be involved. It was a minority of people who were against it, probably you could say, in most places. And the, yeah, and so you risked your, you know, your life, I guess, to be a part of this group. I just thought it was quite interesting when I was researching it to see, um, I was thinking, what did they publish? And they actually published lots of tracks, but the, they had a picture of one of them on one of the web pages. And I thought I'd just share that with you. It's because um, it was written specifically for children. And I thought some of the sentiments in it were, um, it was really calling for equality. And to understand at that time, there was a difference in the abolitionist movement. So you had abolitionists. But a lot of abolitionists were not calling for the slaves to be set free immediately, and they wanted it to be done as a process, and they were not also wanting them to be actually free and equal. They wanted to send them back to Africa. So these were, they had a, a name for it, I can't remember it on the spot, I'll probably find it for you later, something like, um, not immigration abolitionists, but they had a word for it to show that that's what they wanted them to do. But then there were other people calling for the immediate release and the and to give them equal rights immediately. So you can see that a lot of people would be even abolitionists, fellow abolitionists were against that because they were intimidated and fearful that if they gave blacks rights, that they would, uh, it would be a threat. Um, let me just share screen. Everybody see that? Yes, we can see. So this was called the slave's friend, and it said, "I can't see that first line, but it says, I believe that God, the Father of all the, is is the Father of all the coloured boys and girls. That we are made of the same blood. That we are in the eyes of God brothers and sisters. That God loves a coloured child as well as He does a white child. I believe that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That black people are not greater sinners than white people, and that all will go to heaven if they repent, believe in the Saviour, and love their neighbour." I believe that in heaven, all people, white and black, will sit together in heavenly places. I believe that it is wrong to make coloured people sit in a corner in the house of God as if they were not fit to worship God in the same seats with their white fellow sinners. I believe that a person does not love God who hates his brother. So this is very um, similar to what we would be saying today. This is equality. This is saying that we should love our neighbour and that's reflecting whether you love God or not. I believe that it's right to be kind to the poor slaves, to pray for them and to try to persuade slaveholders to give them their liberty. That it is right to say that slavery is a dreadful sin and it is very wicked to buy and sell men, women and children. I believe that it's wicked to have hard feelings toward any colored people, to abuse them or to wish them any hurt. I thought that was quite interesting how they were pushing for equality in this history. They were pushing for um sentiments that I think we as as Millerites, I say we as Millerites back in that history should have been saying. So they're already writing these pamphlets in 1833 around the time of the Millerite movement. And at this time, um, it's slightly later than that point that Joseph Bates gets involved. So we'll bring Joseph Bates into the narrative in a minute. But Emma. Yes. Uh, sorry, who wrote that? Um, I'm not sure who wrote that. It was written specifically for children. It's on the American anti-slavery um, it doesn't actually say who wrote it because it says. But by, by, by it's by a white person, isn't it? I think it's directed oh, towards it? white children. Yeah. And uh, for white children printed for, I'm assuming for a white person. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm assuming most of their literature was aimed at white people because that's their audience in that time period. Although there were, there were free blacks as well getting involved. So perhaps they had some for them as well. I'm not sure. That's just one on, on this. Um, 
Yeah. So it's quite, I just wanted to get some of the background of what's going on here. So this is a subject that is being agitated by religious people and business people in that history, but they are, again, I think, in the minority. Um, let's have a look at... So in December 1833, at the first meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society, I think it was shortened to, um, what did they call it? A-A-S-S, A-A-S-S. Didn't want to put the initials in case I got it wrong. I think it's AASS. Um, led by William Garrison, women were only allowed to attend as observers, but not delegates. Just days later, Philadelphia abolitionist Lucretia Mott, who you might have heard of in terms of the women's rights movement, and 21 other women founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society and immediately got to work. So women in this history started forming um, their own societies because they were not allowed to speak at the men's ones. So again, we can see that women's issues are also being agitated in this history, or, or at least the plight of women was highlighted in that in that narrative. The society and several other female anti-slavery societies around the country used their extensive social networks and chains of correspondence to bring in more members and share their anti-slavery message. They also opened schools, organized boycotts of goods produced using slave labor, and coordinated large fundraising efforts to support the work of the male-dominated anti-slavery society. Perhaps most impactful, and this is where it comes into play, is that so women were foremost in a way in because they had such large social circles of promoting this issue and of agitating it. Most impactful were the petitions these women used as a political tool to try and persuade their lawmakers to abolish slavery. Given that they could neither vote nor hold political office, women relied on petitions as a means of having their voice heard in the government. So women used petitions to get voice heard. So I think it's interesting to see how they, how they managed this fight in this history as well, considering they didn't have a voice as a, um, a voting body. So in the 1830s, abolitionist groups, often organized by women, conducted massive petitioning drives calling for an end to slavery. Southern delegations and their Northern supporters feared that any attention heightened regional tensions and promoted slave rebellions. So they could see that this was agitating the slaves to rebel in the South, that this problem was getting out of hand. The South were very nervous and some people in the North were nervous because of all these tensions. So this led to, on May 26th, 1836, so you have um, May 26th now, 1836, to the, the House of Representatives adopting a gag rule Um, stating that all petitions regarding slavery, so a gag rule is, as we can probably guess, is something, a gag is what you put over your mouth to stop you speaking. So we know we have emoticons today with doing this. Um, and it's symbolic that you are not allowed to speak about something. Mm -hmm. So stating that all petitions regarding slavery would be tabled, we would use the word shelved, I think, today, without being read, referred, or printed. So if a petition came in, you're not allowed to read it, you're not allowed to refer to it, and you're definitely not allowed to print it. The enactment of the gag rule, rather than discouraging petitioners, energized the anti-slavery movement to flood the capital with written demands. So rather than stopping petitions, this increased petitions. And this is very much like we see today when we talk about, you know, the right doing something and it, or the left doing something and it causing a backlash. So this actually aided the movement. So it angered people and increased petitions so that they were flooded with them. I mean, I read somewhere the amount that they, it was a huge amount that they received. It was, they were just inundated with these petitions. Activists held up the suppression of debate as an example of the slaveholding South's infringement of the rights of all Americans. So they said this, this is curtailing the rights of everybody, just like they do in the South against the black people. You're doing it to everyone now in the North. So we're all affected by this. 
If you've got any questions or any comments, please just, just interrupt. Oh, somebody said something. Yeah, reminds me. So Sophie says, reminds her of the Me Too movement in our time. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting how this is being agitated at the time the Millerite history is going on. So we know that Miller has started preaching and it is formally, he starts preaching in 31, but 33 gets his credentials to preach in the same year that the Slavery Society starts. And he's the Millerites are preaching in this history. So let's go to Joseph Bates. In 1833, Garrison had founded this society. He insisted. Now, it's very interesting because Garrison was quite radical. <laughs> so insisted that true Christians could not support the national government or established churches because they sanctioned slavery through law and fellowshiped with people who upheld the peculiar institution. So he was anti-government and he was anti the churches, or at least he was disapproving of them and refused to fellowship with people who upheld this institution. So he was a bit of a, um, yeah, he was an independent really. In addition to advocating political and ecclesiastical come outerism. So as you can imagine, this is a word, it's come outerism, which means one who abandons or withdraws from an established religion, opinion, or custom. So literally come out. So he was supportive of come outerism. We would say probably today he was in the movement, his the movement he had exited from government support and from the churches. Garrison's broad-based peace platform, so he was still a peaceful protester, also included promotion of pacifism and equal rights for blacks and women. So he was um Let's just get rid of that. He was um, anti-government on this issue, um, called people out of churches that supported slavery. And Oh, that was the last bit there. Equal rights for blacks and women and advocated equal rights. So he was quite radical. I mean, this was radical back then, equal rights for blacks and women. And, and some people would have probably advised him, this is going to shut your cause down. Uh, well, people did. This, this caused a split in the society. So Bates, Joseph Bates, actively supported all of Garrison's reforms and defended him publicly during the abolition schism of the late 30s and early 40s. So there was a schism in this period between 33 and 40, between the abolitionists about what they should be fighting for, as we've said already. So they were in disagreement about what to give the black slaves, whether send them back or immediatism. So we'll read about that. So on April 23rd, 1835, Bates and other abolitionists in Fairhaven organized the Fairhaven Anti-Slavery Society, or the FAS. So this is in 35. So just the year before, Bates organizes the FAS. So this is, I'm gonna put that over there. Actually, let's get rid of these petitions. So this is Joseph Bates getting involved in the fight now. The FAS was organized as an auxiliary to the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, which was in turn a lower organization of the American Anti-Slavery Society, both of which remained deeply influenced by Garrison. According to its constitution, FAS was organized for the avowed purpose of effecting the immediate and total abolition of slavery and recognized that people of color, both bond and free, as members of the same human family entitled to the same protection of the same just and equal laws. They advocated equal rights to free blacks in the North, as well as the immediate abolition of slaves in the South. So the, the, freed, the free blacks in the North didn't have equal rights at this point, and they were advocating for that as well. Emma? Yes. When, <clears throat> when Bates gets involved in 1835, um, and he's doing it in his own capacity, so we can highlight him, you know, as standing out because we know him. But was he was what he was trying to achieve with um, FAS and whatever? Was that a big name around, you know, the abolitionist movement? Um, was I don't know if my question makes sense. Yeah, 
I don't know how big it was in the abolitionist movement. I think he met Garrison. I'm not sure. I've not done enough research to know whether it made much of an impact because all these societies were fairly local. You know, people in different localities began to pop up with societies like the Massachusetts one, the Fairhaven one. I don't know what area they covered. I don't even know where Garrison was to begin with. Um, is that the, you're wondering what impact that had on the, the national? Just as a whole, um, like uh, for Garrison, for example, um, and the and American Anti-Slavery Society, the rest of the world today can look at that and be like, okay, that had a big impact. Um, and we will all, outside of this movement, will know who Garrison is because of that. I'm just wondering if Bates is someone we can point to because we know him or was the impact that he had, you know, more widespread as in it's not just something that Adventists will be able to pick up? Well, the interesting thing is Bates is an Adventist at this point. So we'll put that. I in. mean, by Adventists, I mean um, us we, looking yeah, back. Yeah, as history. Yeah, I'm not actually sure. So I think I think Garrison would probably be quite a famous name, or at least the Anti-Slavery Society would. But the problem was Garrison was radical. So we're going to see mm. that there's a split now. So he's kind of put over to one side. Um, and so the anti-slavery society continued until 1870. So this was like 1853 to 1870, because obviously then slavery was abolished. But um, I don't think Garrison was a foremost person all the time, all the way through, because people rejected this idea of immediacy. And Joseph Bates was one of those. So he was a radical. So let's just, we'll carry on reading it. I don't know if it's going to help answer the question. Might have to do some more research on that one, how much influence it had. But, um, but obviously the petitions had a huge influence and that was largely driven by women. So that was quite interesting. To be ab abolitionist in the 1830s placed one, okay, here we go, in a tiny radical minority. So these are tiny radical, which I think is interesting because we're calling ourselves radical feminists. And Bates would have been a radical abolitionist. So this is the 1830s, and they're a tiny radical minority. Just to be an abolitionist, even, even in New England. Indeed, Garrisonians were despised by the majority of white northerners who mocked the idea of immediatism and upheld Jim Crow laws to subjugate the free blacks who were scattered among them. So most of them wanted segregation in the north, even though with the free blacks there already, they wanted them segregated and they didn't like the idea of immediacy, immediatism. For this reason, it's not surprising that a major anti-abolitionist meeting convened in the Fairhaven, New Bedford area a few months after the FAST was founded. So it was anti-abolitionist. So this sparked, the, this, the founding of FAST by Bates sparked um, an anti, a meeting anti-abolitionist. Though at least nine gentlemen of standing were members of the FAST, so they did have nine prominent people in the community in the FAST, the anti-abolitionists in this region claimed no fewer than 20 prominent citizens within their ranks, so they had double the amount of prominent people. The very large and respectable crowd of anti-abolitionists dwarfed the small FAST, and when they gathered in New Bedford's town hall on August 22nd, 1835, officers were elected, a committee was formed, and a series of resolutions aimed against the Fairhaven and New Bedford abolitionists were adopted. So they convened with the purpose of just fighting the FAST. So you can see there the height of animosity in this, in this era. Though these white men professed to detest the evil of slavery, and these are people who are saying they don't like slavery, they objected to immediatism or any other means of abolishing abolishing slavery that might sacrifice the rights of the white population, endanger their domestic safety, or impoverish them in any way. So there's fear in this history that the blacks are, going, are threatening the white population if they give them rights. As Bates later recalled, the fast drew down the wrath of a certain class of our neighbours who denounced us in very severe terms. Threats were often made that our meetings would be broken up, but fortunately we were left to go onward. So you can see how threatening it was to be part of this movement in that history. And they stepped out against double the amount of people against them. When you look at the prominent people, there were probably double the lay people as well against the abolitionist movement and the fact that they are radical abolitionists. So they've got conflict in the, in the group, in the, amongst themselves about how radical to be. And it really reminds me of the women's fight in that history where they're arguing whether we should even push for the vote. Let's push for other things like education and different things because the vote's too extreme and we'll never get it through. 
and you know let's let's go halfway and just get the slaves released never mind giving them equal rights don't you know don't fight for that so it, it, it's really almost like liberal races you know liberal equality like we have liberal and cultural feminism it's it's not the, the radical form but, and yet Bates is standing for the radical form so Emma what were what were they so fearful about the immediacy you know if it had to happen immediately they were afraid because there were so many black people that they would uprise probably overtake the whites I mean some of the things they've said there are basically domestic safety so that's the safety it within their own soil on America that the, the blacks would rise up and kill the whites in in retaliation because of what's been done to them that if they gave them rights that they would get stronger so that then they would become subject to the blacks um what else did it say it would impoverish them in some way so they take their jobs you know the arguments we use people used here in the 1960s when black people came up the whole thing about this the threat that they'll be more powerful than us basically just the very similar to the white supremacy argument at the beginning that america should have a white government and um and it's, it it happens in any population i suppose that threat of someone else taking over speaking different language i don't know there's lots immigrants, of immigrants, fear but yeah. immigration yeah it's the same thing we have with immigration. Very interesting with Jake, uh, Bates as well with gender equality. So along with Garrison and his followers, Bates was an advocate for women's rights. The abolitionists who followed leaders such as Lewis and Arthur Tapan broke away from Garrison in 39 to 40. So in 39 to 40, so over here, we see people breaking away from Garrison. So these are fellow abolitionists. That's Abolitionists split from Garrison. They broke from Garrison in part because they opposed women participating in abolitionist societies or petitioning against slavery. So they went not just against immediatism, they were against women participating. The women question exploded when Abby Kelly was nominated and narrowly elected to serve on an American Anti-Slavery Society business committee. And the Tapans responded by leading a walkout to form a rival organization. Bates sided with Garrison on women's rights. He was acquainted with Kelly personally and attended anti-slavery meetings with her. Bates also supported his wife, Prudence, in her radical abolition activism. Prudence matched her husband's zeal, and on December 1st, 1837, she co-founded the Fairhaven Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, which was the FLAS. So in 1937, Prudence starts the FLAS. Serving as vice president and member of the executive committee for a number of years, Joseph Bates also spoke out on the issue of women partic participating in the movement through the authority of the FAS and the BCAS. For example, in Northern White Men, as Northern White Men began to oppose women acting politically through petitioning Congress, the BCAS responded directly that woman, when she pleads for the oppressed and labors to ameliorate and relieve their condition, acts worthy of herself and of our high duties as an intellectual, moral, and accountable being. And this is Bates's viewpoint. While Bates supported Garrisonian abolition through participation in anti-slavery societies, he also worked with radical Christian abolitionists. So at this time, there were radical Christians who were abolitionists as well. Bates was a leader in the Christian connection and in the fall of 1836, he united with Joshua Hines. So 36, this is when the gaggle is, Bates meets Hines. And as we know, Joshua Hines was the PR person for the Millerite movement and 19 Christian Connection leaders at the Massachusetts Christian Conference on Slavery. So this conference convened in New Bedford to condemn churches and members for supporting slavery. These men resolved it was their sacred obligation to proclaim the holy displeasure of heaven against all unrighteousness and firmly declared their unqualified rep 
reprobation of every palliative excuse or apology which may be urged in extenuation of this sin of slavery. In doing so, they responded to Christians north and south who used the Bible to defend slavery. And Bates accepted the Millerite teachings in 1839. So 1839, which I suppose is kind of around this period when they split. And we know as well about Bates that he was pro-temperance. He had he was teetotal for many years. He was vegetarian already. And he was the one that brought the Sabbath to Adventism after the Great Disappointment. And he went through the Great Disappointment. So he's a key Adventist. And here he is, politically anti-slavery. And I, yeah. So I thought that was quite interesting. So now we get to the gag rule. And... In the US history, any of the series of congressional resolutions that tabled without discussion petitions regarding slavery, it was passed by the House between 1836 and 1840 and repealed in 1844, <laughs> interestingly. So 1836 to 40 and repealed because there was so much against it that they overthrew it in 1844. And I thought the dates for that were quite interesting, really. <laughs> 40, 36 to 40, and repealed in 44. Abolition petitions signed by more than 2 million people had inundated Congress after the establishment of the Anti-Slavery Society in 33. Gag rules supported by pro-slavery congressmen postponed the consideration, printing, and referral of such petitions. Repeal was secure, secured by a House group led by the former president, John Quincy Adams and Joshua Giddings. So I think it was every year, every time there was a new Congress, John Quincy Adams would fight it and he finally won to repeal this gag rule. And then of course we know the rest, that there was a civil war and they finally overturned slavery. Anybody have some new comment? Sorry, I didn't look at the comments. Yeah, we're going to talk about our day in a minute. So Natalie's put a comment about the gag rule with Ronald Reagan um, about reproductive rights. So that's where we're headed. So any questions on this history? I thought that was quite nice to find that out about Joseph Bates. Yeah, Emma, I was going to say, um, you know, you hear a lot about Joseph Bates, you know, as an Adventist. So that really stood out to me. And Emma, just to go back. So there was a bit where you were reading a bit like he understood the sin of, um, of not just, racism but equality just he just understood that message of equality yeah. do you think I know it's hard to 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 kind of know but do you think that he knew that it was a test for God's people or just for humanity because just from his words it sounds like he knew the seriousness of it I, it's really interesting isn't it how why that doesn't become more of a prominent is, his um issue in the Millerite, with the Millerites and with Adventism, early Adventism, but I suppose their focus was spreading the gospel, was getting the Sabbath truth out there. So it seemed like, I don't know what his involvement was, you know, from there on, from 1844, for instance, haven't seen anything about that. So it seems like they just went quiet after 1844. They were focused on spreading the gospel and lost that impetus with that, with that subject. Yeah, and I don't know why Ellen White wasn't, you know, why she was she was so pro temperance, but she wasn't. It, we don't get that same feeling about being anti slavery, and I'm not sure why. I don't know whether it was, I don't know, speculation. It's God's hands over it. The, the message had to go forward that that was the focus. 1850 chart. They should have done. You know, we know that fugitive slave law was 1850. They should have, and they were standing up against it. They were printing it in their papers against slavery. They were writing articles. So I was going to do a bit more research on that one, but it's interesting how far-sighted he was on those issues and he was pushing women's rights, really. Although it, perhaps not the vote, I don't know, but allowing them to speak, saying they're just as, maybe that paved the way for him to accept Ellen White as well as a prophet. But the whole thing is just very fascinating that they didn't quite get that together in that history. Yeah. I'm not sure. 
I think that's what stood out to me, Emma. It's like, obviously, we've got the, the benefit of hindsight now and our lines to kind of look that this is what would have happened if they'd followed it through. So I yeah. think, yeah, maybe I'll dig a little bit more into that history because that kind of stood out to me that he's got almost like the whole package of the understanding of equality on both levels of gender and race. So I wonder what, like you said, maybe it was God's mercy that it didn't so that there was a bit more time for up until our time. I just thought it was really interesting that he kind of knew, had that, I would say prophetic foresight to understand that it, it's an issue. Yeah. And I, and I don't know whether we could say it was, it wasn't, it wasn't too early for slavery. We know that, but it was too early for women's rights, perhaps. Yeah, true. Long before, like we know that someone was, I mean, he was vegetarian, but someone else, I think it was Haskell, was pushing not eating pork. And Ellen White rebuked him and said, if it's time not to eat pork, God will show us. And that was like few, about two or three years before she got the health message vision. And then she gets health message vision and says, yeah, let's not eat pork. But he's ahead of the, ahead of that on that one. And I wonder whether, I don't know, it's just God's hands over the whole thing, but it, it does feel like if the world was to end then, they would not have got women's rights as far as we have today obviously um I don't know whether that would have we'd have just learned that in heaven I think we've probably speculated that already that equality would have been taught up there because we're never even going to understand it all here anyway it's going to be a continual learning process so yeah it's quite interesting so and that Himes is involved in this history as well I mean, the PR person the publishing department basically for the Millerite movement and I think well why didn't he get that I don't know, push for more of that. But their focus changed. And of course, they thought the end of the world was coming. So if the end of the world's coming, the slaves are going to get set free anyway. So why should we, well, up to 1844, but obviously after the disappointment, I think there perhaps could have been more involvement. But maybe we just haven't focused on that history to know because we cherry pick our rights writings as well. To see what we want to see. So bringing it down to our time then, we have... 1984, and this is Reagan now. Um, I don't know how much of a line we need to do for this book. So, 1984, and Reagan. And this is the Mexico City. Mexico City policy, it was called. And it's nothing to do with Mexico per se. And the reason it's called that. Um, it's also been labelled by people as the global gag rule. So this is where we see the word gag rule come back in. Which is definitely not a coincidence. Because this is our history leading up to our time of the end, we know, 1989. And it's Reagan. It's the president who is our history. And Mexico City policy sometimes referred to as by its critics as the global gag rule, is a former United States government policy that blocked US federal funding for non-government organizations or NGOs that provided abortion counseling or referrals, advocated to decriminalize abortion or expanded abortion services, when in effect the Mexico City policy is a US government policy that requires foreign non-governmental organizations to certify that they will not perform or actively promote abortion as a method of family planning. With non-US funds as a condition for receiving US global family planning assistance. So what that means, it was first implemented in January, on January 20th, 1985. So And it basically that uh, that at that time, well, before that time as well, um, the U.S. government funded lots of charities, NGOs, non-governmental organizations around the world, health clinics in different countries of the world. They channeled fund funding into them and these health clinics were much broader than they weren't abortion clinics they were health clinics for reproduction for hiv they were broader than just being even about reproduction but they had a huge part of their work is family planning mm -hmm. and contraception and abortion if necessary but that was i guess a small part 
of the the rest of it to support HIV people. So it was it said funds as a condition for receiving U.S. global family planning assistance. And during its January 23rd, 2017 implementation, any other U.S. global health assistance, including global HIV and maternal and child health assistance. So it required these organizations to stop talking about abortion, to stop offering abortion. The policy requires non-government organizations to agree as a condition of their receipt of the funds. So they would get the money if they agreed. If they didn't agree, they wouldn't get the money. That they would neither perform nor actively promote abortion as a method of family planning in other nations. The policy has exemptions for abortions performed in response to rape, incest, or life-threatening conditions. So it made an exception for rape, incest, and threatening conditions. Uh, let's see. So it stopped funding. Let's put for abortions. For NGOs and non-government organizations around the world. So to give a bit of background as to why Reagan did that, Obviously, he's anti-abortion, he's right wing and he's being we've got the, the whole lead up to that in the 1970s with the Christian right and getting politically active. But what was this Mexico City? Why was it named Mexico City? So it's named the Mexico City because the venue of the United Nations International Conference on Population and Development was where it was announced was was that's where it was held. It was the venue for the United Nations. So in that year, 1984. There was a UN International Conference on Population and Development. So I just wanted to take a quick look at what that's about and see the impact of that on this discussion. So the policy was instituted by Reagan in 1984. The final language is interesting. He didn't even go to that conference. The final language of the 1984 policy was negotiated by the deputy chairman of the U.S. delegation, Alan Keyes, then an assistant secretary of state. So I'm not sure if he was there as well. I think he was there, but Reagan wasn't. So let's look at the history of the World Population Conference. So the first ever World Population Conference was held at the Salé Centre, Geneva, Switzerland, from the 29th of August to the 3rd of September in 1927. So you have, as a build up to this, you have 1927. And this was basically part of the League of Nations. And the League of Nations was, was the precursor to the United Nations. So this was the, the League that was formed after the First World War to call for world peace, basically. So it was organized by the forerunner of the United Nations, the League of Nations, and Margaret Sanger. The conference was an attempt to bring together international experts on population, food supply, fertility, migration, and health to discuss the problem of human overpopulation. So this was concerned with, um, let's see, immigration, reproduction. So these, and these are the issues very much topical today, I think. So we can see this build up to it after the second, the first world war. Education, uh, reproduction, food supply. The conference was organized with funds donated by Sanger's husband, Joe and J. Noah Slee, as well as a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. Bernard Mallet presided over the meeting and William March, these are just names that were there. Over the past two centuries, the global population has increased from 1 billion to 8 billion due to medical advancement and improved agriculture productivity. So they were discussing the fact that the world is overpopulated because it's using up resources. So it's connected to climate change as well. And, and how they're going to manage this problem. So it's that 1 billion to 8 billion in two centuries. So in two centuries. One billion has gone to eight billion. And they were predicting that it would rise further, obviously, by 2050 and then 2021. I mean, 20, the 21st century, 22nd century. So that was the first one. And then the first, and then the United Nations was formed, obviously, in 1946 after the Second World War. 
and they had their first conference in 1954 in Rome and their second one in 65 in Belgrade, a third one in 74 in Bucharest and a fourth one in 1984 in Mexico City. So this was the fourth one. And the number four is interesting in our history. This is the fourth and final one. Actually, no, it wasn't the final one. I think they had a 94 and they, they changed the title of it, uh, the name of it, I think. But the interesting thing about this one, the conference received considerable media attention due to disputes regarding the assertion of reproductive rights. The Holy See and several predominantly Islamic nations were staunch critics and US President Bill Clinton received considerable criticism from conservatives. Sorry, this is the 1994 one. So in 1994, they had an inc international conference, again, on population and development. So 94, they have the fifth one. And it's at this one that the papacy and Islamic, what do they say, Islamic nations. Elsewhere it says Arabic, Arab nations. And Bill Clinton received considerable criticism from conservatives for his, for his participation, considering the fact that Reagan did not attend or fund the previous conference held in Mexico City in 84. The official spokesman for the Holy See was Archbishop Renato Martino. Martino was Pope John Paul's second official, Pope Paul Paul's II's official representat representative at the 1994 conference. So Martino represents the papacy in this history. He's at the conference as a spokesperson for the Vatican. And he had the task of defending the church's anti-abortion teachings. So he's anti-abortion, he's defending this teaching before a European American bloc that strongly supported access to abortion. Martino was able to find support from Latin American and Arab countries that were anti-abortion and the Cairo conference was ultimately inconclusive. So this was held in Cairo. Um, and they didn't really resolve some of these issues. They came to a stalemate because you had um, Europe and America. America versus Latin America and Arab countries. So South America, basically. And the Arab world. So we can see that, and, and because America had a big voice in this, we can see that if America switches its position, the whole thing will be tipped in the balance. So now we get down to the Trump administration. So that's where the the gag rule is. And what's happened since then, I'll just fill you in with a little bit. So Reagan is obviously Republican. Every time a Republican, so Bill Clinton gets in and he rescinds the gag rule, the Mexico City policy, he does away with it. Then the next Republican gets in and he brings it back in. And then the next president is Democrat. So Obama does away with it and, and stops the global gag rule. So they reinstate funding for these organizations. And every time these Republicans, so there's this been yo-yo effect since it was first implemented by Reagan. So I just wanted to go back and see the history of that from the 1970s. Okay, well, let's talk about Trump and then we'll, then we'll backtrack. The Trump administration has expanded its ban on funding for groups that conduct abortions or advocate abortion rights known as the global gag rule and has cut funding to the Organization of American States for that reason. So he signs this and, and the picture, this was a, a Guardian news article from, what's the date of it? Sorry, let's get the date for you. It was 2017 when he signed it, I think. 2019, so this is March, 2019. So let's bring it down here. 
and there's a picture of Trump signing it in the in the Guardian article. So Trump brings in the gag rule again, basically. And the caption under the picture says, just read what it says. How Trump signed a global death warrant for women. Which I thought in the light of our message is quite interesting. So Trump brings this back in. The new policy was announced on Tuesday by the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who declared, this is decent, this is right. I am proud to serve in an administration that protects the least among us, the unborn baby. The Trump administration has already expanded the reach of the funding ban, which dates back to the Reagan administration, to apply to all US healthcare assistance, totaling about $6 billion. So he cuts funding funds for the totaling $6 billion. Um, once protecting the environment and bipartisan support. Okay, so yeah, so now we're going to go back in a bit of history here, that in the old days, protecting the environment had bipartisan support. So everybody was in agreement at these world conferences up to now. Up to the 1970s, basically, the Democrats and Republicans were supportive both parties supported protecting the environment. Similarly, after World War II, US elites generally agreed that the United States should work to curb population growth worldwide. And this reason for this was because as the Cold War began, they worried that if populations in underdeveloped parts of the world expanded too quickly, that would hurt economic development, destabilizing these regions and threatening US national security. So again, it was a fear for US's own they were protecting themselves, basically, that they didn't want other economies to expand too quickly because um, that would disadvantage them. President Lyndon Johnson in 1965 warned of an explosion in world population and a growing scarcity in world resources. So they have this narrative up until um, the 1970s that we should protect the world's population, that it was a good idea to limit this funding. Just wanted to find that again, hold on. Just because it said something about what happened in the 1960s. Never mind, I might introduce this, you can read the article afterwards. So skipping to the 1970s now, what changed? So up to this point, up to the 70s, we had this, both parties agreed on it. Population growth became a partisan issue in the 1970s. So now it becomes a split issue in the 70s and has stayed that way. Until Ronald Reagan announced the Mexico City policy in 84, the United States was not merely a global leader in international fam family planning, but the global leader. By then, the United States had become the architect of much of today's family planning infrastructure and had been a key mover in founding the United Nations Fund for Population Activities in 1969. So basically up to the 60s, US was the predominant um, country pushing for reproductive health rights for women around the world or for people around the world to support people in their reproductive choices and to give people health care so that women, women and children were not so much under threat of dying. Oh, and men as well, in fact, because of the HIV virus too. So they were foremost in leading the world in this issue connected to population control. But when you get to the 70s, meanwhile, the cultural and religious right became more prominent in US politics during the 70s. So now in the 70s, you get this shift. Although its agenda was broad, it was united against the idea that people worldwide had to be persuaded to have fewer children. The new right made both social and economic arguments, including promoting the idea that population growth would level as development increased and government intervention was unnecessary. The new right backed Reagan, pushing him to focus on ending not just abortion, but also limiting birth control and sex education. All this put them directly in opposition to anti-population growth environmentalists of the day. So now you get this split 
between people who are anti-population growth of the day and then this new right who are saying we need to end abortion, we need to limit birth control and sex education because they were pushing now, well, from a moralistic standpoint, they didn't agree with abortion or contraception, but they're pushing, they're not so bothered about population growth because they're saying it's going to level as we go forward. It's not too much of an issue. So then we come to each iteration of the global gag rule has been blatantly coercive, both in intent and practice, and is moving forward in lockstep with the in lockstep with the Trump administration's non-stop assault on reproductive health services, said Heather Boonstra. She's head of public policy at the Guttmacher Institute, a research and advocacy group on female and reproductive health. This ideologically driven policy undermines the very goals of US foreign aid programs by harming the health of people in developing countries, violating medical ethics and trampling on democratic values. So she's recognizing that this is um, obviously undemocratic. Um, harming health, especially women and children, but men as well. In foreign countries. And then violating medical ethics by not giving people the proper treatment. So let me get down to Biden now in our time. President Biden rescinded the so-called Mexico City policy on Thursday, and this was when he got in, in, and this is the Washington Post. But they're saying that every time it gets reinstated, when Trump reinstated it, he made it worse than before. This was January 2021, so as soon as he gets in, Biden overturns it. But they're saying every time a Republican government gets in, they bring it in, and Trump brought it in on a worse level. So Biden appeals the gag rule. Nicknamed the global gag rule, the policy prohibits foreign non-government organizations that receive US funding from providing information about abortion as a method of family planning or from lobbying a foreign government to legalize abortion. This move makes Biden the latest presidential player in a 28 year game of ping pong in which Democratic administrations rescind the policy and Republican administrations restore it. And then this article, which is in 2021, goes on to talk about this ping pong between the two parties. So any questions so far? Any thoughts, any comments? Somebody put something in. I think what was interesting for me, Emma, is this role of um, the, the NGO, the non-governmental organizations. And what came to mind is in, um, in Afghan Afghanistan at the moment, with the Taliban kind of coming to power and that kind of dictatorship, one of the latest things they did at the end of last year was they stopped women serving in NGOs. And it's interesting, I didn't really, I don't think I understood the, ideology, I think that was one of the words that was used as you were reading some of the articles behind that. So obviously you see the, the sexism, of course, you know, women can't, but as I'm seeing kind of this political stance of left versus right, NGOs, depending on how you view them, they can help advance women's rights, reproductive rights, you know, access to contraception, family planning, um, the right of a woman to have autonomy over her body so it's interesting to see even in Afghanistan how they are trying to place this same I wouldn't say the same because I've not really looked at it but I just think there was it was interesting to see that similarity on this line and with what's happening in Afghanistan as well 
Yeah, I think that's a good point. And obviously, Afghanistan would fall under that one of these Arab countries that would be against this abortion anyway and against women's rights generally. So that fits in with that. Um, but it's amazing that swing, that swing of America, how it was protectionist of, I suppose you could say, of all those groups and of those women and of the health of the worldwide. They were helping. And then it's in this 1970s with this swing to the right that they've cut this funding. It's interesting as well when you start looking at the groups that um, some of these NGOs refuse to stop abortions and refuse to stop talking about abortions and they lost something like a quarter of their funding. So pa Planned Parenthood has clinics all over and they refused. Um, and there was another country that refused, but Colombia and Romania said, OK, we'll stop doing it. And they still receive all their funding. But the interesting thing is as well that when they started doing research on this, it starts as an anti-abortion policy and they're trying to limit abortions, but abortions in nearly every country where those funds were cut went up because people got pregnant that didn't want to because they lost, they didn't come and get family planning. Somehow the family planning, you know, with the contraception, but under Trump, this is under Trump, from 2017, abortions have gone up, more unwanted pregnancies and more backstreet abortions and more deaths of women. But the ironic thing is that abortions have gone up in nearly all those places so it hasn't had the desired effect they wanted about stopping abortion obviously that's it's all political anyway but that's that was the thrust of their argument because we can stop abortions mm -hmm. and so it's actually had the opposite effect so that this article which we've got we've got a little bit of time left we could start reading some of this so i could probably share screen this is the washington post article from 2019 I think it might be helpful to read some of this. So, oh, that's the bit we read already, some of that. So this says that policies promoting family planning once had broad support from both Democrats and Republicans. So both parties supported family planning. So that's anything from contraception, you know, advice before marriage, after marriage, um, any other things that connected to family planning. Abortion was one of them, but it's not a key thrust to enabling people to manage their family life. Then we read about how it had support before and it changed after the Cold War. The state of address a few years later, Michael Goldberg. A few years later, so that's what I was looking for here. A few years later, according to author Michelle Goldberg, Republican President Richard Nixon made showing population growth a higher priority than any previous president before him. Others pushed the United States to get involved in curbing births globally as well, including John Rockefeller III, who in 1952 helped found the Population Council and through the Rockefeller Foundation funded numerous studies of world population growth. So they were, they wanted to stop world population, they wanted to slow it down. But then in 1960, Democrat President John Kennedy cautioned the US against getting too involved in promoting family planning, suggesting it wouldn't look good if the United States appeared to advocate limitation of black or brown or yellow peoples whose population is increasing no faster than the United States. Some American groups, notably the American Catholics, always opposed US support for international family planning, but many Republicans supported Planned Parenthood. So many of them were supportive of helping these nations to limit the growth of their families, but Obviously, there was a reservation there in pushing other people in parts of the world to stop having children. And on the backside of that as well was China. I think China raised the, I think they might bring up China. They bring up China in this article. They brought up China and how they had the one child policy and how that was um, very coercive to people. So that was one of the things they started to talk about as well. And then we read how it became a partisan issue in the 70s, that it split the parties over this issue. Oh, here it brings out China. And if somebody else wants to read that, that paragraph and we have a volunteer. So before that, just to give some background, that previous paragraph is saying that there was, until Reagan announced the Mexico policy, the United States was this global leader in international family planning. The United States had become the architect of much of today's family planning infrastructure and have been a key mover in founding the United Nations Fund for Population Activities in 1969. 
So it was pushing forward with helping people with family planning. So what broke that consensus is the question. Can somebody read that? Cedri, are you there? Do you want to read that? Or anybody else? Curtis? Yeah, I'll read it. Thank you. So what broke that consensus? Several factors combined to make the change. Internationally, cold water tensions eased with detent. And as, yeah. <laughs> and as birth rates began falling around the globe, Republicans no longer felt, felt compelled to stop other countries' population growth to protect U.S. national security. At the same time, groups were beginning to expose the Chinese government's coerc coercive abortion and sterilization as part of its one-child policy under which most Chinese citizens could have only one child per couple. Information that UNFPA had helped support those forcible measures came to light before the 1984 International Population Conference in, New Me in Mexico City. <clears throat> the, UN and <clears throat> the UN and UNFPA came under fire for awarding the first United Nations Population Award jointly to that person who led the most coercive phase of China's one child policy and Indira Gandhi, who forcibly sterilized millions of Indians. Um, so, what are we getting from that? Um, I'm going to have to read that. Sorry. I know. I'm, I'm just wondering who the, the UNFPA is that the, the United Nations Fund for population something probably like. family planning something yeah, that's true yeah just quickly look that up so i i guess the author's pointing out that um i don't i don't know what role the cold war played in in brokering that originally but um with the cold war tensions easing up that had an effect I'm not sure how or why, um, but generally around the world, birth rates began to fall. Um, and so Republicans um, didn't have as much urge to stop other countries' population growth to protect U.S. national security. Again, I'm not sure what the link is there. Um, Just to, it, it, I think, interject, I think that... But as they saw the tensions easing, as countries began to relax around the Cold War, they weren't so hostile towards each other and the relations weren't so strained. That's what detente means. They, and it's connected to the fact that they felt, you know, originally they had these population conferences because they felt in 1927 that, um, or even 46, that US was under threat if these other countries expanded too quickly. I think we read that earlier, that other economies boomed, mm -hmm. that they would be under threat on the global scale of being so powerful. Okay, so yeah. they... Um, <clears throat> with the birth rate falling, they feel that in terms of the threat, I'll use the yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and so people are pointing fingers at the Chinese government's one child policy and its uh coercive abortion practices, um, and etc. And so they don't want to take as much heat as China is taking, um, for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it seems that the United Nations, um, the UNFPA, which is the United Nations Population Fund, came under fire for awarding, for giving an award to China because they're reducing their population because the measures used were not good. And so they're saying, you know, let's, so there was this disagreement now about how much we should be pushing for populations to be controlled mm -hmm. and on the back of that because of this one child policy. So do you think that was a good idea then? What's that? For the for, for United States to do that. Do what, bring in the Mexico City policy? Yes. No, I think this article is not arguing that necessarily because it says before that 1984 Mexico City conference, it seems like the United Nations is supportive of China doing that because the whole world is agreed we need to reduce population 
But now, as that comes to light, how they're doing it, they're saying, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing that. And then at the same time, we get this religious right coming to power. So it's on the back of that that they bring in the Mexico City policy, which was this controversial, to say the least, so people didn't agree with it. So we've already read this, how the new right came to power and pushed Reagan to end abortion, limit birth control and sex education. And that's why he passed that Mexico City policy, the gag rule. And then we get to this bit. See, did you want to read this bit by the early 1980s? By the early 1980s, social conservatives began to lobby the executive branch to defend, to defund UNFPA. Lobbyists made convincing arguments that Reagan's re-election chances would be greater if he broke with the establishment and supported the anti-abortion movement's campaign against family planning worldwide with an announcement to the Second International Conference on Population in Mexico City from August 6, 14, 1984. That's a long sentence. Yes. <laughs> Organized by the UN, the conference was scheduled to take place just weeks before the 1984 Republican National Convention. So I think probably have to read the next bit as well. So he's, did you understand that bit? Um, no, really, I would probably have to go over it again to understand it. So the UNFPA, which the, the United Nations Population Fund, is the Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, and their mission is to deliver a world where every pregnancy is wanted, where, so, you know, if you don't want it, they're gonna have it to you, basically, as well. Um, I'm just looking at their, what their um, strategy is. Here we are, what we do. Okay, so they a humanitarian organization that helps funding family planning, HIV, maternal health. So supports all these health rights around the world. And now in the 1980s, these conservatives are saying we should defund it. We shouldn't give so much money to that. They made convincing arguments about Reagan's re-election chances that if he supported the anti-abortion movement he'd get re-elected so it was a political maneuver and and so that they're pushing for these anti-abortion people to have a voice basically so if you read the next one their efforts work their efforts their efforts worked at the conference Reagan abandoned established U.S. foreign policy he called population growth a neutral phenomenon and stated that US policy in the 1960s and 70s that aimed to limit their growth was an overreaction. Before the policy, there, was, there were legislative restrictions on US funding for abortions internationally. NGOs had to keep US funds segregated but could use non-US funds for some voluntary abortion-related activities. Under the new policy, however, segregated funds were no longer enough. By bypassing Congress and going straight to the executive anti-abortion groups got what they wanted in the first place. In response to Reagan's announcement, Congress enacted the Kemp-Caston Amendment in 1985 to withhold US funding for UNFPA. So basically, he played down the idea of population growth, and and you see that it's not just about population growth. That's a bit of a, it's a covers everything, but it's all about the health of these people in these nations and their funding for all these health clinics. So he said it's an overreaction that we don't really need to control the population like that. So we don't need to fund them, but it's all connected to funding abortions ultimately. NGOs had to keep US funds segregated, but could use non-US funds for some voluntary abortion-related activities. But they get this funding cut for the segregated funds. It's not enough that they get given now by America. And they withhold the funds from this organization. 
So we know this is a ping pong pattern that goes backwards and forwards now. So we have here, Reagan may have been the first Republican president to restrict US funds for any foreign group advising women that abortion might be an option under the Mexico City policy. But each of his Republican successors has followed suit, starting with Bill Clinton, then Barack Obama, and now Joe Biden. Democrats then rescind the policy to increase what reproductive right groups and their supporters frame as an issue of women's access to health care. So since then, Americans have grown more partisan, which means their parties have become divided. So Democrats feel abortion should be legal in all or most cases, while 62% of Republicans or those who lean Republican think abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. So we see that shift, as we know, with Roe versus Wade and what's happening with abortion clinics or what was happening with abortion clinics under Trump has, has just echoed that sentiment that they want to restrict it not only abroad, but in America itself. So we can expect that if a Republican president gets in at the next election, that this policy will be reinstated. I think as well, when Trump did it, it was affecting American clinics, which we know are affected now anyway, with all the laws on abortion being, with Roe versus Wade being kind of smashed. We know that people's rights or their access to contraception and abortion has been affected in most US states as well. But we can see from this that it's it's only going to get worse. If when a Republican gets in, they're just going to reinstate the policy. So we'll finish there. I think there's still more research we could do, but I think it's very interesting that we have been for some years now saying that our the subject in our that's being agitated in our history obviously is not Sunday; it's women's rights, and. We have wondered how it's going to be a global issue. We know that gender is a global issue, but when we think in terms of restriction or laws, we think, how's that going to affect every country of the world? And I'm not saying that this is it, but I just see how this has global impact on the healthcare in all these nations where America funds these NGOs. And these NGOs had to stand up against that test in, under the Trump administration. Were they going to capitulate and say, we won't do abortions, we won't talk about them, we won't give access to them? And some of them did that, and we saw that there was a rise in abortion. There was a, a rise in, in health problems in these countries, obviously, when that happened. And some funding came from elsewhere. So some countries stepped in to fund. I think Canada was one of them to send funding to pan, Planned Parenthood, I think, when they lost that funding from the US. But we can see from this model that America is a huge voice. We know it's a huge voice on the UN anyway. We can see that, that how the UN has been used in this situation to, or is in, involved with these conferences and how that affects these clinics and it's interesting how this has been labeled the global gag rule and how we see the gag rule as associated with slavery in that history and obviously it's gender in our history i think that's no coincidence politically and that we know that trump bought this death warrant for women in this history and we know that's a, a warning to us of what's going to happen with the next republican administration so it's quite impactful on the world women and the world's health. And as Sophie brought out of Afghanistan, we see that already really restricting women's rights and health. So anybody got any questions or any last comments? Sophie says, thanks Emma, really highlighted how the Sunday law issue of women's equality impacts other countries. I was just reading about Uganda and how women rely on NGOs for safe abortions as abortion is illegal except for a few exceptions. Yeah, so they can actually, and, and Natalie made the point, it stops care and treatment for LGBTQ people as well. So in a country like Uganda, where they don't have support for abortion, they can go to a probably an American-funded clinic and get help. So these clinics are fundamental to some of these people. Well, let's pray. So close. Dear loving God, we thank you for your protecting care over us as individuals, but also over the whole world. The way that you have led the US in the past to stand up for people's rights, for women's rights and reproductive rights, and be a foremost leader in this fight around the world for people to have access to healthcare. But we see them speaking like a dragon on this issue and repealing this policy and instituting this gag rule. We pray that you would be with our fellow human beings around the world who are suffering, women and men, but especially women who are oppressed and 
um, held in captivity and slavery to these vicious laws and to the men around them. We pray that you would guide each one of us how to help this situation, how to stand up, how to fight. We thank you for the example of Joseph Bates in the Millerite history. We pray that we would be faithful to the job that you have given us to do and that you would help us to be brave and courageous to speak out against the wrongs that we see being done and to defend the defenseless. We ask that you would give us courage and boldness as we see the day approach and help us to look beyond the trouble to your second coming, which we long for. Our hearts desire it. We love to see your face, Lord, and sit down and discuss all these things with you face to face. We pray that you would guide and bless us for the rest of this Sabbath day. And we thank you for the fellowship that we can enjoy. In Jesus' name. Amen.